Now, I apologize for keeping you a long time, but I'm not here every Wednesday. <laughs> and I did want to carry the argument, such as it is, to its conclusion. So let me just have a scan here at the group of questions and uh, that are coming up here. Is there a difference between an objective moral standard and the concept of evolutionary survival instinct? Could evolution be the origin of morality? Now, of course, this is tangential to the subject. What I was trying to address is the problem of suffering. And however you account for the origin of morality, we discover ourselves to be moral beings. If you account for the origin of morality within an atheistic worldview, then my argument stands. So this is not strictly relevant to it. And so a very brief answer will have to do. The difficulty in developing morality on the basis of the observation of subhuman species is you can develop any morality you like. Because, I hear somebody saying how you anticipate me, um, Darwin saw ants cooperating and he thought that was a base for altruism. Spencer saw nature red in tooth and claw and coined the phrase the survival of the fittest. And depending on which morality you go to, you end up in the gas chambers or something less bad. <laughs> so that's one of the major problems. But it's a, a, a separate problem, and I'm not going to go more into it, because I've actually written uh, quite a lot about it in my book, Gunning for God. And that uh, applies to several of these questions. They are bypassing what I'm claiming, because they're attempting to account for morality on some basis or other that rejects God. Well, that's OK. But what I'm saying is that atheism whether or not you can account for morality on that basis is no solution to the problem of pain and evil. Doesn't utilitarianism resolve the problem of moral right and wrong without God? Here's another example of that, which I didn't address at all. I'd be very happy to give you a lecture on utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a marvelous scheme if you've got equal centers of power. If you're dividing ice cream among 100 children, you better do it um, uh, in a utilitarian way, uh, giving uh, the maximum benefit to the maximum number of people. In other words, dividing the ice cream millimetrically equally. But if I have enough power that I don't care what you do, and you come along and say to me, you'd better, you know, share with me or I won't share with you, I'd say, pardon? What will you do about it if I don't? And you can see that in the, in the history of Hitler and his trajectory. When he was a political infant, he made, uh, he made treaties. Once he got power, he tore them up. Utilitarianism works at a certain level, as do many ethical systems. They overlap, actually, and that's a huge topic on its own. But it doesn't solve the problem of unequal distribution of power, as many people have seen. Um, let's see what else there is. How do you deal with the Old Testament texts that speak of God commanding people to kill, asked four times? That's interesting. And God killing people, etc., etc. Well, it's, it's very interesting because, again, it's not relevant to my topic, although I'm going to say something about it. My topic is the relationship of Christianity to the problem of suffering and evil. And Christianity is post the Old Testament. So these are technically questions in a pre-Christian time, they need, of course, to be addressed. And again, I would just suggest to you very briefly one or two things to think about. The first thing is this. Let's take the typical account that people are referring to here, the invasion or the entry into Canaan by Joshua, and the question of getting rid of all the inhabitants and so on. And people say, there's genocide, it's awful, God commanded it, etc., etc. Now, we judge it. Where do we get the morality with which we judge it? In the very book that describes it, the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. 
It's not in some peripheral, obscure part of the Bible. This account of what happened is dead in the middle of a book that sets up the morality with which we condemn it. Now, that ought to strike you as interesting, because it tells me immediately, of course, that the Bible itself is not ashamed of putting the two things together. So maybe I'd need to think a little bit more about it. What is going on? The second point to observe is this, that God is not treating the Israelites as his blue-eyed boys who can do no wrong, because he points out to them, if you behave like these people have done, you will suffer the same fate. And of course they did. Point number three is that 400 years before it happened, God told a man of Abraham, of whom you've heard, that his descendants would stay in a land that was not their own, that is Egypt, for 400 years, and then they would come up. And the delay is caused by what? By the fact, according to the text, that the iniquity, the sin, the violence of the Amorites is not yet full, so that the entry of Joshua into the land coincided with the judgment of God on the horrific practices, including child sacrifice and every conceivable thing, of the Amorites. And the reading of the original history shows you that it was God's mercy that he didn't intervene any earlier. And the next point is that as we look at it and ask ourselves the question, what is going on here? Because in this book, there's not only the morality that we use to condemn the action, there are the first humanitarian rules of war in the very same book. And it's worth reading them. You sue for peace wherever possible. You don't destroy the crops. You don't kill the women and the children and all the rest of it. All in there. The first humanitarian rules of war in the very book that tells you what happened. So now you've got a very interesting problem if you take the text seriously. You've got to ask what the phrase is, kill all of them, what does it mean? Because in some chapters you find it seven or eight times over, like a technical phrase. And when you meet that, you need to be very careful. For instance, a trivial example of this is, all Israel came to the funeral of King Solomon. Well, there are lots of them in bed with the flu and some of them on holiday and all the rest of it. Like we would say, the whole of England came to the funeral of Princess Diana. What is that saying? It is, of course, deliberate hyperbole that everybody recognizes. Now, the command appears to say, wipe the whole city out. Did that happen historically? The answer is no, and it can be determined within the text itself. All those cities remained with populations in them. So they can't have been completely wiped out. And so certain scholars, notably Nicholas Woltersdorf and others like him, who have taken the text seriously, putting that all together, have come to the conclusion that the reason that the book itself doesn't say how awful the whole thing was, is that it was done within the parameters that are set by the rest of the book. And what the phrase, wipe them all out, is the kind of thing you might do at an ice hockey match. Are the Maple Leafs an ice hockey team? <laughs> are they? Are they? <laughs> so, you're shouting for them, and you're calling for them, wipe them out, kill a lot of them massacre them. Don't you do that? We do it at rugby matches. You know, when it's the Irish against the English, give them it, wipe them out, slaughter the whole lot of them. But what do we mean? Win, that's what we mean. Now, if we do that in ordinary situations, there's an argument for Scripture using technical phrases to do the same thing. Now, of course, that's only my suggestion. And uh, it's not my suggestion, it's suggestions of others. But I'm not sure that we can just write this down as genocide and all the rest of it at all. But now, I'll go round the other side. And I say, when you've done all of that, you're still left unsatisfied for the reasons I give you in my talk. 
we're still facing the fact that not the relatively few women and children, if there were any at all, that were killed then, but the many who've died since I started the lecture, what are you going to say about them? It doesn't solve that problem, you see. And that's why I come back to the fact of the big question for me, ladies and gentlemen, is granted that we see this ragged thing that we cannot cope with, it's overwhelming, are there any grounds for trusting God with it? Now, that's a very daring question to ask and an equally daring question to try to answer. But it's the only way I can begin to see a way in. Because when you've settled, if you can, the whole problem of the Old Testament, you still have to deal with what's happening right now. So that's my initial approach um, to that question. Why is religion necessary to overcome moral evil? Are not some atheists morally better than Christians? Well, of course, I have said that. And I haven't been talking about religion overcoming moral evil. I've been talking about the problem, let me repeat it again, ladies and gentlemen, of pain and suffering. That's a separate question. Is religion necessary to uh, overcome moral evil? Yes and no. Because, you see, if every human being is made in the image of God, that teaching is a teaching of Christianity. It's a biblical revelation. It's religion, if you like. And even if you don't believe it, you act like it. So, in that indirect sense, you're using religion to overcome moral evil, even though you're not recognizing the source. Can the experience of grief bring one to the point of despair? In his book, A Grief Observed, C.S. Lewis talks about grief after losing his wife. Well, of course it can bring you to a point of despair. We are broken human beings. All of us are damaged in some way, body, mind, and spirit. And sometimes these things are overwhelming. And we're so simplistic, you know. Would you forgive a personal reference? I, I had no intention of talking about this, but just to illustrate it. I shouldn't be here. I should be dead. Eight years ago, I was rushed into hospital and given no hope of living. I said goodbye to my wife, thinking that that was it. So I'd been through that experience. And I was thrown, literally, onto an operating table and operated on. And 40 minutes later, the surgeon bent over me and he said, Professor Lennox, he was a, a rather dour Scot, he said, you should be dead, mon. <laughs> which was a very cheery message <laughs> and he said actually I don't understand you should not be alive you should have been wiped away by the most massive heart attack but for some reason your heart hasn't even been damaged I put a stent in you can go home tomorrow now people say to me do you thank God for that yes I do but at the very same time, my niece, 22, just married, had an explosion in her brain. It killed her. And it brought my sister nearly to despair. What do I say to her? I thank God for me? No. We've got to be so sensitive to these things. We've got to be so sensitive. Because, of course, my sister will wrestle with that all of her life. Her lovely girl who was a Christian, married to a youth pastor, just wham, and gone in six or seven weeks. We've got to be real, ladies and gentlemen, and we're so facile, and we can, in our facileness, bring other people to despair. Suppose I were to go around saying, isn't it wonderful? What a wonderful chap I am, because God saved my life, and people suffering out there, untold misery. That is cruel, you see. So we need to be very, very careful about these things. Be thankful, of course, in our hearts, but don't parade it to the distress of others. And of course, when despair comes, you will know that sometimes the psychological pressures on the chemicals in our brains and our bodies and the pressure on our emotions is too much and we experience some kind of breakdown and we need help from professionally trained people. 
And one of the things that I have to be at least a little bit capable of doing is to recognize when my competence is exceeded and refer people to the appropriate medical help. And just as we go to the doctor if we break our leg, so if something breaks down at the level of our psyche, it's appropriate to go and see someone who's trained in psychological medicine. So let's have a look at another question. What time do I have to stop? Another few minutes, have I? OK. That's all right. Do leave if the number 10 bus is coming. But um, <laughs> Why would God make humans knowing they would disobey? Well, I think I've attempted to answer that. It's because he wanted to make people that had real value, that were human, that reflected his image. He's a creator. He wanted to make them creators, little creators. And he himself is love, because that's where the doctrine of the Trinity comes in, which people mock. But at the very least, what it's telling us is God is a fellowship. He's quite complex. There is relationship within what is called God. And that's reflected on the human level. And so it is unavoidable. I still think that Lewis has some of the best things and the most sensible things uh, to say about this. And now I see that someone has misheard my Irish voice. Can you elab elaborate on the phrase beauty in barbed wire? I didn't use that phrase. I said beauty on the one hand and barbed wire on the other. What is your opinion? What is your opinion on the original sin in quotation marks as the starting point on the evil? Well, the biblical record doesn't blame humans for everything. That's interesting to start with. It gives us less detail than we would like. But the beginning of Genesis indicates that there is an evil, non-human being within, I nearly said the universe, but within reality. And that is in one sense comforting. It's saying that you're not to blame for everything. I mean, you know, we trace our history back. I had a wonderful father, but he wasn't perfect. I'm a father, I'm far from perfect, and so you can trace damage back and back and back. Am I responsible for it all? Actually, no. And nor are you. And that actually can be a colossal relief. But it can tell you something. If I didn't engineer it, I'm not going to be able to solve it. It's bigger than me. And therefore, the real question comes, granted that God took a risk, in creating beings like us, did he make a big enough provision for when things went wrong? And of course, that's the message of Christianity, which is unique. The provision is so big that because we didn't engineer the whole thing ourselves, we are responsible, of course, but not at the level of engineering the whole of tragic history that God decided to solve the problem by someone else stepping in and taking our place. That's where the fairness of God's solution comes in. And the genius of the Christian message, if I might say it, is that instead of asking me to repair the damage by behaving well, how could I when I'm damaged to start with? God says that he himself through his son, will bear the debt and the judgment. Well, you may not understand it, like we don't understand energy or light, but at least you can test to see if it actually works, as I mentioned last night. Now, I could go on about Genesis and so on, but I'm not going to, because I'm going to come to this. If there is no pain and suffering in heaven, 
are we no longer human but automatons? That is in heaven. Is heaven a robotic place and is there free will there? That's a logical question to ask after listening to what I've just said. <laughs> well, I'll tell you how I begin to think about it. Heaven is not a place where we will sit on clouds and play guitars. <laughs> it is one of the most thrilling concepts and it's so exciting that it's mostly described in the negative because we can't really imagine what it's like. There's no suffering, no pain. Magnificent ideas. Is there really a world like that? And is it a robotic world? I don't think so. Because you see, I don't think that what happens is we go round in a circle right back to where we were at the beginning, before humans had rebelled against God. Geometrically, I liken it a bit more as a spiral. That is, we go round and up, and we end up above the beginning. But you see, let me explain it this way. When I received Christ as Lord and Savior, something irreversible and eternal happened to me. I received eternal life. And I deliberately gave up my own autonomy to receive that. The basic Christian confession is Jesus Christ is Lord. So I have, in that sense, very deliberately submitted myself to his authority because of the love he's shown to me and what he's done for me. I cannot then opt out of that. It's not that I lose all my freedom at every level. I'm free to do, well, all the things I do. But I have received an irreversible new life. And when all the trappings that have been built into my personality by my evil nature have fallen off and I arrive in glory, it is because of that irreversible decision that it'll be very different up there, it'll be infinitely better. But we will not lose, of course, the capacities that make many delightful things in this world familiar to us. In that graveyard, which I mentioned earlier, where Jesus met Mary and Martha, he said a very interesting thing. He said to Martha, who was the intellectual among the two, he said, your brother will rise again. He didn't say Lazarus would rise again, although he meant that. But he meant that the relationship would continue. That's very exciting, isn't it? I'm going to see my dad again. And however it's all worked out, I tell you it's going to be infinitely more interesting than this world. Because if God can make a world like this that the best minds over the centuries are only beginning to scrape at the surface, what that world to come will look like when we are given, of course, new bodies, there's, you know, God hasn't finished with physics and chemistry. That's, that's old Greek philosophy that matter is evil. The Bible says often enough on page one that God saw that it was good, that we ought to take it seriously. There will be a resurrection, which means standing up of the body and all that kind of thing. So that's a little response to that. And yes, I, I respond to this here. Is the ultimate ground of hope Jesus' resurrection? Yes, it is. In the past, he rose from the dead. And that is why my experience of his guidance and his transformation of life, such as it is, is absolutely real. But let me take you to that forward day as I conclude. We've been talking about pain and suffering. The promise of Scripture, Lewis says you must not leave this bit out, is that there is a world to come in which Christ is the center and sun, the powerhouse of its energy, the word that governs its intelligence and its intellectual content. But as I say, it's described mostly in the negative. There is no death. There is no pain. 
there is no sorrow, there is no suffering. And then, the book of Revelation says something magnificent. And God himself shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. What sort of a God is that? My government doesn't even know I exist except on the tax form. <laughs> Here's the nature and the heart of God. How often have you let someone wipe the tears away from your eye? Very rarely. Do you know why that is? Because the eye is the most sensitive organ. And if somebody else holds the handkerchief, they're liable to give you a very, very painful eye. Because even the slightest poking damages it. What a description of the nature of God. He's so sensitive to your hurt that you're experiencing today that he will personally hold the handkerchief that will finally dissolve forever the tears of those who trust him. I hope you can see why I'm not an atheist, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>